I invite you to take your Bible and turn to James chapter 1. It's page 845 if you are using one of the Bibles that are around you in the pews. Let's read verse 5 of James chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Father, we pray now that you will open your Word to our hearts as we turn our attention to the pages of James. Grant to us diligence and help so that we might not simply understand but might come to believe and obey your Word and trust in your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we are continuing what is a series of studies just recently begun in the book of James, if you're visiting us today. And we have been not only reading the text as we find it here in the uh, New International Version, but we've also been reading the paraphrase provided by uh, J.B. Phillips, a paraphrase which I commend to you. If you can find one in a second-hand shop, uh, then you will be glad to add it to uh, your library. And Philip's paraphrase is verse 2 as follows. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. And what we've discovered is simply this, that when we come to see trials as they are identified here by James as a privilege that our Heavenly Father has afforded us, so that we might become, as verse 4 says, mature and complete and not lacking anything, when we can understand that trials have that end in view, then, and only then, will we be able to discover joy in the midst of the test. Because it is so counterintuitive to the way in which uh, most of us are tempted to think. Most of us are tempted to think that the removal of trials is the gateway to joy, that the presence of trials is to rob us of our joy. And James says, no, we should count it all joy when we face these trials because of God's purpose. Poetically, we have sung, and we can't keep singing it, um, uh, uh, Graham Kendrick's uh, words, where he says quite wonderfully, uh, paraphrasing this again, God is at work in us, molding and shaping us out of his love for us, making us more like Jesus. So when we come to these things and we ask the question, what in the world is going on here? Uh, How are we to respond to this? What is happening in our lives? And each of us has circumstances that fit adequately under the heading of trials of many kinds. Then we need to know that God is at work molding, shaping us, His motivation is out of his character because of his love for us, and his purpose is to conform us to the image of his Son. That is the significance of Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What is the good to which he works? It is to conform us to the image of his Son. And some of the things that come our way do not fit within the category of good as we would understand it, but God uses them in order to create this ultimate good. Now, James recognizes, obviously, the uh, kind of significance of these three verses, 2, 3, and 4. James is uh, firing, if you like, from the hip. It is a rapid-fire volley that uh, calls us to practical Christian living. And once he has said what he said— in the first four verses, it's no surprise that he then uses verse 5 as his follow-on. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Now, that's a fairly familiar verse to any of us who know the New Testament. 
We quote it all the time in relationship to making a decision about a job change, or if we're wondering how to handle our teenage children, or if we have some other question that's on our minds. And that, of course, I think is an entirely legitimate way to reach in and take a verse of Scripture and make application of it. But I was challenged by the fact that I had never really considered verse 5 in relationship to verses 1 to 4 and 6 to 9. Because when you look at it contextually, when you look at it in its specific terms, then you begin to get a grasp of the development of James's thinking. Again, I think Phillips has helped me most with this, and I quote this to you again. Notice the word process. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, don't resent them as truders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed, and you will find you have become uh, folks of mature character with the right sort of independence. Now, notice the bridge here. And if in the process any of you does not know how to meet any particular problem, you get it? There is a process that is going on here. And if in that process you don't get it, then he says, let me tell you what to do. Because let's be very perfectly honest, there is a challenge in this experience, and not all of us respond in the way in which James directs us to. So, what we'll do is we'll ask and seek to answer three very straightforward questions. Question one, what do we need? Question two, what should we do? Question three, what will we find? First of all, then, what do we need? What do we need? Well, the answer, in a word, is wisdom. We need wisdom. James is very gracious. He doesn't say, you know, you folks are all desperately in need of wisdom. He says, if any of you should lack wisdom, which is a fairly comprehensive way of approaching it, I think, if you're honest, which of us would put up our hands and say, oh, well, I just think I'll go, to the, go and get a coffee at the moment if you're going to be talking about wisdom. I really have wisdom covered. No, none of us would want to say that, would we? We'd be very proud and silly. If any of you should lack wisdom, yes, I do. Okay, good. Well, I have your attention. Let me just speak to you about that for a moment. What is it that we need? We need wisdom. It's an interesting word, wisdom, isn't it? Have you used the word wisdom this week? Have you seen it in the New York Times? Did you see it in the Wall Street? Did you come across it anywhere? Did you hear anybody talk about wisdom at school? Did you sit in a class and have your teacher tell you that the absolute essential that you must get out of your educational process as you move now into your final year of high school is that you become a wise boy or you become a wise girl? I doubt it very, very much. Wisdom has largely been obscured by notions of insight or information or even intelligence. And while all of those things may contribute to the notion of wisdom by themselves or even together, they cannot be equated with it. Education is not necessarily synonymous with wisdom. <laughs> I only need a few school teachers or college professors to come up here and speak to that. You know that you have highly intelligent people who are under your care, but not the wisest bunch you ever ran into. Indeed, if education is really the panacea for all the ills of America, then why are we in the predicament we find ourselves in? If all we really need is education to stop doing all the bad things and start doing all the right things, why is it that we continue to do so many bad things and fail to do so many right things? The answer is education can't handle it. None of us would want as Christians to denigrate education per se. But education is not wisdom. And it is wisdom that Paul says we need. You see, wisdom in the Bible is not simply a cognitive thing. Wisdom in the Bible is not simply a matter of the mind. Wisdom in the Bible is a matter of morality. Wisdom in the Bible is about the behavior which accompanies our belief system that we believe in a certain way, and as a result, we behave in a certain way if we are wise men and women. You have that, for example, in this story Jesus told when he said, you know, there, were, you know, there was a fellow and he, and he built his house on a rock. 
And it stood firm against all the winds and the waves, and another fellow built it on the sand, and it came down like a ton of bricks. And what was his application? The wise man or woman is the one who hears my words and puts them into practice. The fellow who built on the sand also heard the words, but didn't put them into practice. And wisdom is godly insight applied to the living of life. For it's no surprise, then, that Solomon was commended by God when, in being given the opportunity to ask for anything that he really desired, he asked God in this way. And this is 1 Kings 3. You can check it at, at home. O oh Lord my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father David, which is good news. That's, it doesn't say that. I just put that in. But, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Incidentally, humility is a precursor for wisdom. You never met a wise man or a woman who was proud. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast in his strength, or the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows me. And the beginning of wisdom is in the knowledge of God. Anyway, your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. What is he asking for? He's asking for wisdom. That is why, parenthetically, an educational system that does not begin with wisdom, that is based on a relativistic approach to information and to morality, is destined eventually to crumble. Because inherent in wisdom is the ability to discriminate and to discern between right and wrong. And therefore, when Solomon puts pen to paper and gives us his Proverbs, we're not surprised, given that he asked God in that way, that he begins the book of Proverbs as follows. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding the words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence. See, you can be highly intelligent and not do what is right and just and fair. One of the reasons that the Chinese government likes to have Christians come to fulfill roles in engineering, in mathematics, in medicine, and in literature is because they have discovered that Christians bring not only intelligence, but morality. They don't necessarily embrace, in fact, they may well be opposed to the Christian foundations but they understand the radical difference when they have a college professor who is honest and upright and moral and true. Well, you see, it is wisdom which allows a man or a woman to do what is right and just and fair. So let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So, wisdom means acting in the light of God's revelation of himself in the varied circumstances of our lives, whether in joy or in trials. Wisdom, if you like, the wisdom we need is the wisdom to know how to live God's way in God's world. You need to know how to live God's way because this is God's world. And if, if we're going to live in wisdom, then we have to live congruently and consistently in light of God's revelation of himself. Wow, that is so countercultural, isn't it? It is so cross grained to the world in which we live. So radically different to Cleveland, radically different to Corinth. That's why when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, What have the philosopher, the writer, and the critic of this world to show for all their wisdom? Stand up, he says. Stand up and tell me. 
Hasn't God made the wisdom of this world look foolish? Yes. Bertrand Russell, probably the finest philosopher of the 20th century in the English-speaking world, happened to be British. And if you read Russell, as some of us had to, as a punishment, <laughs> you end up with the tragic emptiness of it all, summarized in the classic statement, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair may the soul's habitation be built. How foolish is that kind of stuff? No, says James. If you're going to come to terms with the circumstances of your life, if you're going to face your disappointments, your fears, your trials, your disappointments, if you're going to acknowledge the fact that this is not some super long pancake breakfast where the band plays your favorite music and we all dance around uh, the fairground, if you are going to face up to that, if you are going to acknowledge that joy is found in the midst of that in recognition of the ultimate purposes of the God who has revealed himself savingly in Jesus, then you need wisdom. And if any of you lack wisdom, let me tell you what to do. That's our second question. Question number one, what do we need? Question number two, what should we do? Simply ask God. Oh, it's got to be more difficult than that, isn't it? No. Ask God. Who is God? Well, look at what he says of God in verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who doesn't change like shifting shadows. You don't go to him on a Sunday and find him one way. Go to him on a Tuesday and find him another way. He is a God who takes the initiative, choosing to give us birth, how? Through the word of his truth. Why? So that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. This is the God to whom we come and ask, a heavenly Father. A heavenly Father, who in a way that is far more expansive and far more appropriate than even the best of earthly fathers, gives good things to them that ask him. Gives good things to them that ask him. Well, how should we ask him? Simply and properly. Properly. Don't we teach our children to ask for things properly? I don't know that many of us are doing a very good job, to tell you the honest truth, parenthetically. And one of the reasons is that we don't do a good job, most of us, in asking properly ourselves. So we tell our children one thing, and then we do something else, and we're surprised that they do the same thing that we do. Have you listened to people ask for things in McDonald's? This is how it goes. I'll take a number two. Oh, you will? Yeah, I'll take a number two. Give me a Diet Coke. 98% of the time this week, listen and check it and come back and tell me if I'm right or not. I guarantee you, nine out of ten times any request made for any service in the entire continental United States comes out of the lips of people who do not ask properly. Please, may I have? May I please have? Could I please, if you wish so on? No. Give me. Go to Starbucks and Chagrin and stand there and do the observation. I'll take a latte. I'll take a thing. I'll take a thing. I'll take a thing. Oh, you will? Do you ever think of saying please? No. They don't ask properly. No surprise, we come to God in the same presumptuous way. We come to God the way the prodigal comes to his father. Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Hey, you owe me. No, I don't. So if we're going to ask for wisdom, we need to ask properly. How is it to ask properly? Well, it's to ask humbly, is to ask sincerely. In terms of the writer to the Hebrews, it is to come to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. When he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Now, that believing there is not simply intellectual assent. Believing is an expression of trust and confidence and devotion. 
It's not simply believing in the possibility of, it is believing to the point of resting in and trusting in our Heavenly Father. In, and conversely, to doubt doesn't simply mean cognitively to wonder intellectually about something, but to doubt in this way is to refuse to entrust ourselves to our Heavenly Father, who is so glad to provide. Again, J.B. Phillips, he must ask in sincere faith, without secret doubts, as to whether he really wants God's help or not. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? Coming to God and asking him sincerely, believingly, trustingly, without in the back of our minds entertaining secret doubts about whether we really want God's help or not. Because after all, since God's purpose is to conform us to the image of His Son, to make us mature and complete and lacking nothing. And since in verses 2 and 3 we've already discovered that He is determined to employ trials and difficulties of various circumstances in order to achieve His ultimate end, if we're going to come to God and ask Him properly, not simply for what we think we need, but for what He tells us we require, then it may take us back down that old trial road again. It may take us back into daunting circumstances again. But that's what it means to believe, to trust. We come to God in the face of trials and in the face of difficulties, in childlike trust, asking Him to help us to see things properly, to see things in such a way that we're ultimately able to say that we view our sufferings as light and momentary afflictions that are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. That's not natural, loved ones. That is not natural. To view our sufferings, and there are sufferings in this congregation that are, that are deep-seated and ongoing and daunting, such as most of us know very little about, a realm of spiritual geography that we have not even put our feet on the first the first rung of the, of the ladder to mix metaphors. We have not even set out on the first part of the journey. Are there trials and temptations? No. Is there trouble anywhere? No. Well, we should never be discouraged. Why? Because we can take it to the Lord in prayer. But you see, when we ask Him for the wisdom that we need— to live in the way that He wants, we must not then proceed to do things in our own way. When we ask Him for the wisdom we require to live the way He wants, we mustn't then proceed to get up from our knees and to do our own thing. That's the third question, isn't it? And that brings us to the end. What do we need? We need wisdom. What should we do? Ask God. Thirdly, what will we find? What will we find? Well, let's take it in reverse order, first negatively and then positively. We will find that when we try to hedge our bets, okay? Verse 6, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind— that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. When we try and hedge our bets, when we try and ride the, the up escalator and the down escalator at the same time, when we try and ride two horses, one horse called faith and the other horse called doubt, not only do we find ourselves at odds internally, but we will not, he says categorically, receive anything from the Lord. It's just not going to happen. I have people all the time pastorally asking me, well, you know, I've prayed about this. What does that mean? Do you worship with God's people? No. Do you read your Bible? No. Do you have any interest in the things of grace? No. Well, you might as well go rub the belly of a genie for all the hope that you have. 
because you cannot come to God with divided loyalties, anticipating that he will respond to you in accordance with his purposes. You see, that's, I think, the only way we can understand this, because otherwise we have to say that if anybody ever has doubts cognitively, if anyone has ever has any doubts intellectually, which covers most of us, right, if we're honest, there has to be some time in the day or some week in the year where you go, wow, do I really believe that? Then we have to bring our doubts and doubt our doubts as much as we doubt our certainties. But I don't think he's talking cognitively here, as if he's saying, if you've ever had a question about the resurrection, there's no point in you praying to God. There's not a chance that he's going to answer your prayers. That doesn't make the, the slightest bit of sense, does it? So it can't be that. No, the doubter here is the man or the woman whose prayers and whose actions are at odds with one another. They are diametrically opposed to each other. Classically, in the prayer of Augustine, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. That's what he's referencing. I want to be pure, O God, because I know I'm supposed to be, but it's Friday night, and I don't plan on starting till Monday. That man should not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. To receive God's gifts, the gift of wisdom, we have to say no to the hypocrisy which prays for wisdom and then acts like a fool, which prays for sanctity and then acts in immorality, which prays for grace and then acts in, in self-righteousness. That kind of thing, says James, will get you in a dreadful mess. Such a person is, and James, you will find, uses these amazing analogies from, uh, from the natural world throughout these five chapters, and here's the first of his. That kind of individual, he says, the man who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the winds all over the place. He's a double-minded man, verse 8. He's unstable in all he does. Let me say just a word to my Christian sisters here for a moment. If you are dating such a character, dump him. Dump him. In fact, you have my permission to take your cell phone and send a text message right now <laughs> which says, Goodbye, Charlie. Why? It's the only wise thing to do. Don't kid yourself that the guy wants to pray with you. When after he has prayed with you, he wants to play with you. And if in this context you have no control, don't think for a nanosecond that when he marries you that you'll be able to handle it. You won't. If any of you lack wisdom on this, ask God. That was just a little parenthetical statement. <laughs> finally, finally, and ending on a positive note, what will we find? We'll find that the double-minded, unstable man, blown around like the winds of the sea, will receive nothing from the Lord, but we will discover that when we come to the Lord sincerely, in childlike trust, and in complete honesty, he, he responds generously and graciously. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, because he gives generously to all and without finding fault, and it will be given him. In other words, he doesn't make us feel guilty or foolish for coming back to him with the same or the similar question which if you think about it in relationship to school, weren't those the teachers that really helped you? That although they knew in their heart of hearts that you were a pain in the neck, that although they knew that they, you had answered, that you'd asked the same question last Tuesday, last Thursday, and on Friday just before school ended, and then Monday morning dawns, and who's the first one up at the desk? You were asking what? Same question. And everything in them wanted to say, go away, and never come back. And yet they said, let's just look at this again. That's why I love English literature. That's actually largely why I have zero interest in science. My English teacher 
loved me into Shakespeare. My science teacher tried to beat my hands into a discovery of the periodic table of the elements. I developed a distinct disinterest in the periodic table of the elements <laughs> and found great delight in Shakespeare. Now, the fact that I'm a complete idiot as far as science is concerned, I don't want to tie to getting a hammering from my teacher. I think I predated that with my complete incompetence. But you know, when you get by with a little help from your friends, who knows what might have happened? I know that I will never forget Mr. McFadgen, because Mr. McFadgen is the teacher who told me in front of the class that instead of having a head on my neck, I had a turnip on my neck, <laughs> and asked me to stand and tell the class what I had on my neck. So I stood and told the class, class, I have a turnip on my neck. And they loved it because they knew it was true. There was no point in me complaining to my father. My father knew I had a turnip on my neck. I don't hold any bitterness against Mr. McFadgen, but I can't think of the word McFadgen without thinking of its implication. He made me feel like a complete idiot. Any question I had, you're an idiot, Beck. Can you understand this? What's the problem with you? God doesn't treat us like that. We can come back to him again and again and again. That's what he's saying. If you lack wisdom, if you can't get this joy trial thing going, if you are up against it, if the world is falling down on your head, and you are prepared to come to God and ask him simply and properly, you will discover that he gives generously, comprehensively, and he does so without ever making you feel guilty or without ever saying to you, I can't believe you're asking the same question. What a wonderful God to whom we can go. What a faithful God. That's how we began this service, wasn't it? We can come to him. In the words of Johnny Cash that I quoted at Founders Week on Friday night, I'll probably never get invited back for quoting Johnny Cash, but from the Man in Black album is one of my favorites. You know, I talk to Jesus every day, and he's interested in every word I say. And no secretary ever tells me he's been called away. I talk to Jesus every day. James understood that. James was Jesus' brother. You can do this, he says. The late Archbishop of Canterbury, Donald Cogan, was a wise and faithful pastor, first as a pastor of a flock before he became the leader of the Anglican Communion at that point in the 1960s. And it was said of him, quotes, that he gave consistent advice to the puzzled, he gave warm encouragement to the promising, and he gave compassion to the perplexed. You know, in that respect, he was godlike in his character. Here comes the individual, puzzled by things, consistent advice. The hopeful individual with promises and desires for the future, warm encouragement. The perplexed individual, unmitigated compassion. Now, when he has reached that point in verse 8, he then applies it. And he applies it in a quite staggering way. He applies it in terms of financial status, social status. And verses 9, 10, and 11 uh, will be the focus of our study this evening, as we ask the question, what does it mean then for the wisdom of God to be brought to bear upon our position in life, our bank balance, and our view of the future? Because it's got to mean something, right? If it doesn't change things there. Well, Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for James, for his clarity, for his straightforward approach to practical Christian living. We want to come to you humbly and simply, properly, asking you for wisdom, 
so as to be able to reflect on the issues of our lives in a way that acknowledges joy in the trials and your design for our ultimate good. Forgive us when we are bouncing hither and yon, when we are like the waves of the sea, believing and doubting and trusting and ignoring. No use to ourselves and really no use to anybody else. We don't want to be those double-minded souls. Forgive us our divided loyalty. And thank you for such a wonderful picture of you as a God in whom there's no variableness, neither shadow due to turning, to whom we may come and be treated with generosity and with grace. And although we often have the same questions, to discover that you don't make us feel guilty or find fault. I guess that's something of what it means to come to the one who is the God of all grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one now and forevermore. Amen.